Welcome to our first webinar of the 2022 new year. I'm Danny O'Connell, president of the largest Irish organization outside of Ireland. We are Irish, we are Catholic, and we are American. We are the ancient order of Hibernians in America. Today's host will be Martin Galvin, chairman of our Freedom for Ireland Committee. Many of you may not know, but Martin was the individual who asked candidate for US President Bill Clinton during the Irish American President Forum about many, many years ago, I should say, if he would allow Jerry Adams to travel to the United States if elected president. The answer was yes, and the rest is history. Today, Martin leads the work needed for us to focus on Irish America and the key issues facing the North of Ireland, including legacy justice in the United Ireland. The Ancient Order Hibernians today is titled, Make Britain Keep Promise of Legacy Justice Appeal, and takes place on the second anniversary of Britain's new decade approach agreement with the Irish government and six political parties. This falls into a, the British government's favorite category, known as broken promises. As they promised two years ago, within 100 days, to publish and introduce legislation in the UK Parliament to implement the Stormont House Agreement and maintain a broad-based consensus with the Irish government while recognizing that any Westminster laws on legacy should have the consent of the Stormont Assembly. Friends, I present to you Martin Galvin. Thank you, Danny. As um, our National President Danny O'Connell has just mentioned, two years ago, British promised that finally they would do what they had already originally promised six years earlier, enact the Storm and House Agreement so that people whose family members have been killed in controversial circumstances, with involved, especially those with involvement with British Crown State Forces, would have an opportunity to get to the truth, to get to justice. Instead of implementing that agreement, the British issued a command paper saying that they would give us a statute of limitations, really an amnesty dressed up as a statute of limitations, which would cut off any path to justice in civil actions, criminal actions, inquests, in ombudsman investigations, anything else from victims, uh, the families and relatives of those who had been killed. Uh, today, we have three examples of those families who wanna make a direct appeal for American help because they feel that that's their best chance to get Britain not to go through with this new injustice. But we're gonna begin by one of the key members, the leaders in Congress, somebody who's been a leader on Irish issues for a long time with the Friends of Ireland. Most recently in November, he spearheaded along with Congressman Neal and others, a letter signed by more than 20 members of Congress precisely on this issue to the State Department, the Secretary of State, uh, Anthony Blanken. He's now not only a leader in Congress, but he is a candidate for the governor of New York State. Congressman Swazi, would you tell us about your letter in November and what you and the Friends of Ireland are doing on this issue of legacy justice? Hey, Marty, thanks so much for uh, introducing me. And uh, Danny, thanks for having me on. Thanks to the AOH for paying so much attention to this issue and trying to bring it to people's attention. Uh, I was approached to some of my, by some of my Irish friends uh, about this issue. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm uh, got an Irish legacy myself. My great grandfather, uh, William T. Holmes is from County Cork. I've been involved in Irish justice issues for a long time. Uh, and I was approached uh, about this issue that the British government was proposing to provide an amnesty uh, to people, in effect, uh, who were involved in the troubles and resulted in the deaths and, and uh, uh, murders, quite frankly, and beatings and other injustices uh, during the troubles. And uh, you know, there's political reasons for it, why it's going on in the UK. It's probably an effort to try and uh, reach out to some veterans groups and things like that. But the reality is, is that it's completely unfair. Unfair to the folks that you've got on here today. I know you've got Shauna Quinn on here and uh, Willie Lawfren and uh, Mar I don't know if Marty McCallan's gonna, gonna be on or Mary McCallan's gonna be on yes. or not, uh, but you'll be hearing their stories. Every single family that was devastated uh, by the injustices of the British government and you know non-state actors as well that abused people, killed people, 
beat people, imprison people, uh, still are searching for justice all these years later. And we've made a very big point in the US government to say very clearly uh, when it comes to trade and when it comes to other issues that we're not gonna do anything that undermines the Good Friday agreements. And quite frankly, the idea of uh, providing this uh, statute of limitations, which in effect provides for amnesty, does that. It undermines the agreements completely and it undermines the justice for all these families. So we got a bipartisan group of about 20 some odd members of Congress to sign a letter to Secretary Blinken to say, speak out against this. We need the Biden administration to please speak out against this to stop the UK government from doing this. Now, we haven't gotten a response from the government. And what I'm hearing back, you know, we know President Biden is on board with us. Uh, you know, he's got a strong Irish heritage himself. When he was asked if he had a comment for the BBC when he first was uh, elected, he responded back to the reporter. He says, I'm Irish. <laughs> uh, so we know he's going to be looking out for our interests here. And it's the, what I'm hearing through back channels is we're not going to get a response to our letter officially until the UK government actually makes a formal proposal because they've backpedaled on this. It was supposed to come out in the fall. And hopefully our pressure and your pressure is working. So we stand with you. You've got support in Congress. We'll do everything we can to help you. And uh, thanks so much for inviting me to come on here today. Congressman, uh, I should have also mentioned you are a member of the Ancient Order of Hibernians and Tim Miles Mike would Moran never forgive me. Tim Miles would never forgive me if I didn't mention that, but we wanna thank you for your leadership in that letter, which I know is important to all of these families and your leadership on many years on Irish justice issues. And the, just good luck in your run for governor. The only thing bad about it would be we'd lose you in Congress, but we might get you in a different position, more important position. Listen, you'll always be able to count on me and I'll always stand with you 100% of the way, not only because of my Irish heritage, uh, but because of the issue itself. And my grandmother on the Italian side always uh, had a saying. She said, you like a me, I like a you. So <laughs> I'll be keep on looking out for you guys. Congressman, I know you had a busy schedule today and you did a lot to juggle it around to fit us in at the start. So we just want to thank you uh, very much again for, again, the letter, for all you've done over so many years on the Irish justice issues. And wish you the best of luck. Have a great day, everybody. And for those families that are on here, listen, we care about you. We know you've been suffering for many years. And we're going to do everything we can to help fight for you. Thanks, Thank everybody. you again, Congressman. Okay. God bless you. Okay. Wait, Danny, now we're going to go. We actually have three examples of what would happen if the British go through with their new amnesty, statute of limitations, formal final cover-up, or what they intend to be the formal final government cover-up of British murders in the north of Ireland, of British conduct in the north of Ireland. We have three cases, three individuals representing three cases. One, the first one, involves a very close friend of mine, Liam Ryan. He was killed in November 1989. At that time, he was somebody well-known, an American citizen, lived in the Bronx for a number of years, went home to buy a, a family-owned bar with his family, uh, married, raised a child, was murdered at the front of his bar, the Battery Bar in beautiful uh, Loch Ney. And at that time, Congressman uh, Thomas Manton, who was a leader in the Irish issues, demanded a formal State Department investigation. Uh, Cardinal O'Fee attended his funeral. Bernadette Devlin attended. Uh, Bernadette Devlin McAlisky attended his funeral and said it couldn't convince anybody. It would be hard to convince anyone there that it wasn't members of the UDR involved. Jerry Adams was there. Martin McGinnis. Uh, the deputy leader, Seamus Mallon of the SDLP, complained and asked questions. And for all of that. That case, collusion, was never investigated. It was just made a joke of by the RUC who came to his family. And that issue, justice, was never investigated. But now we're finally on the verge of a new investigation, an explosive new report that shows exactly how the British were involved in collusion in the murder of this American citizen. And we're fortunate it's that reports being done by relatives of justice and the person who's putting that report to bear, Mary McCallan is on, is with us today. Welcome, Mary. Thank you, Martin. Thank you uh, to everyone who's attending and viewing today. And um, I'm delighted to be able to speak about the case on behalf of the Ryan family. Um, and just to say that relatives for justice um, have contact and support uh, both Liam's widow, Geraldine, and his son, Declan, um, but also Liam's siblings, uh, Libby, Margaret, Bridget, 
Joe, Anthony, Eugene, and we also spoke with his sister, Nancy, um, about the report prior to her uh, dying in the last few years. Um, it's been a really interesting case um, from, from our point of view to look at, um, and we know that it's an important case um, because it draws attention to um, the wider patterns of collusion uh, that have happened within that area. Um, and RFJ work with a number of families who've been affected by it. Um, and there are links between Liam Ryan's killing um, and Shauna Quinn's case, which she is going to talk about today. Um, and that's important that we highlight those. So I, I'm very conscious when I'm speaking here that there will be people who knew Liam um, in a personal capacity. I know that you, you, you knew Liam, Martin, and that you've been um, very uh, good in terms of assisting us. Um, and knew him personally to know more about uh, his life in America prior to his return to Tyrone in 1987. So Liam had returned to Tyrone in 1987 and had purchased the battery bar. Um, and as Martin said, it was a family run um, bar. Um, and Liam's wife was actually present in the bar the night that he was shot, as were a number of his siblings. His sister Libby um, had been at the front door just prior to Liam going to the front door and, and being shot. So it's very difficult for them because a number of them were either present when the attack took place or present in the immediate aftermath of the attack. Um, so it's just to bar that in mind. Liam was shot midweek um, on a Wednesday night on the 29th of November um, in 1989. There had been a darts competition that had been taking place in the bar. Um, and another man was also shot, Michael Devlin, and he was one of the darts players who had attended um, to take part in the competition. Uh, so Michael Devlin and another three men were stood at the entrance and exit of the bar um, getting ready to leave. Uh, they heard a knock at the door and Liam had asked whether or not anyone had heard a, a vehicle approaching, um, which they thought was odd. And as he opened the door, it was pushed open by a man wearing a balaclava, closely followed by another gunman who then opened fire. So Liam and Michael were killed um, in the hallway. Uh, three, the three other men had scattered and tried to move away from the scene. One of them was injured. He was shot in the leg in the back. Um, and the other two men had managed to get into a nearby toilet and escape being shot. Uh, what became apparent in the immediate aftermath was that um, the police really, uh, who were at the scene, had no real intention of investigating um, the attack. And Liam's siblings, whenever they attended, um, his sister Libby, she stayed uh, with the bodies because she was very worried that the RUC might plant, um, you know, some material or interfere with the bodies in some way. So she actually stayed uh, present with the bodies at all time. But his siblings formed the view that it was not really a murder investigation that the police were there to carry out. It was more a case of them celebrating a successful plan. That, that was it the opinion that they formed and that there was a number of police that arrived on scene, uh, very casual, um, laughing, joking. Uh, one officer turned up wearing his bedroom slippers, uh, you know, just to see what had occurred. Um, and that, you know, uh, there was really no intention of investigating in any way. Uh, I suppose whenever we think now of um, crimes being committed and murders taking place, one of the things that we would um, expect would be that the area would be cordoned off, that people wouldn't be able to come and go freely, that there would be some attempt uh, to protect forensic evidence at the scene. None of that happened in Liam Ryan's case. Uh, local people were still digging bullets out of the holes of the pub um, in the weeks after uh, you know, that the attack had happened. Um, so RFJ have worked with the families um, and it's really a joint approach in terms of trying to obtain a proper investigation into Liam's case. Liam's widow, Jardina the next of kin, has attempted to have a fresh inquest ordered in the case um, and she's pursuing that with the assistance of her solicitor, um, Fergal Shades from Madden and Finucane. Um, myself and my colleagues Mark Thompson and Mike Ritchie have worked uh, with the family to put together a complaint um, to submit to the police ombudsman um, and that's really outlining the failures in the RUC investigation. Um, I suppose what 
what makes Liam's case unique is that, you know, in his case, we're not we're saying that it's not only failures to investigate, um, you know, after the events have taken place, but there's a number of issues in Liam's case that make us um, believe that there has been prior planning and prior assistance by the RUC to the loyalists that carried out the attack um, and that they've more or less been um, provided with the weapons uh, shepherded in and out of the area um, and you know then obviously very little investigation took place so with that turning of a blind eye um, that's also collusive behaviour and um, the evidence can I, that we- can, I, can I ask just um, what are the one of the things that is important in this is weapons that were involved from Martin Mallon through the inquest uh, of Roseanne Mallon had shown a direct relationship with some of the weapons that were involved in Liam's death. They were used then in Kappa in some of the other killings. Um, what did you find about that in your investigation? So in relation to Liam's case, whenever the inquest took place, uh, a forensic officer um gave evidence that there were three, possibly four weapons that were used. Uh, One of them was a a VZ-58. One of the weapons was from the South African shipment of weapons. One of the weapons was a revolver. Uh, Some media reports say that the other weapon was a single um, barrel rifle and others say that it was another revolver. Um, But the VZ-58 weapon was definitely from the South African shipment of weapons. And those of you who've had an interest in Lachan Island um, and the Ombudsman's report into that will be aware of the circumstances of how that came in. Um, Very, very clear evidence of collusion. Uh, Liam, the attack on Liam Ryan took place in November 1989 on the 29th of November. But on the 24th of November of the previous year, There had been another murder um, very, very close in the locality of a man called Fila McNally. And Fila McNally was the brother of Francie McNally, a Sinn Féin councillor in the area. Um, And his other brother uh, was a well-known Republican as well, who was later killed in Coke by the SAS. And the weapons that were used to kill Fila McNally were then used in the attack on Liam Ryan and Michael Devlin and used again at Boyle's Bar and are connected to a number of other cases in the area, um, which, we, which we go through and outline, as well as attempted murders. Um, so, you know, there's clear evidence there of collusion um, and clear evidence that the failure to investigate the earlier attacks has then left people and those weapons free to carry on and continue their murder spree within the area. Could I ask, I, I was familiar with that area. That was a very well-known Republican area, but it used to be heavily patrolled. Uh, would be difficult to get in and get out without being stopped. How were these killers able to go in, get out, get completely away without any interference from the British patrols who would have almost always been there at all times? It's interesting because in the research and from speaking to the witnesses in relation to this particular attack, they say that the the area was swamped with Crown forces that day um, leading up to the attack. Um, But then there was very, very little presence about in the early evening immediately beforehand. Um, The Battery Bar is on the shores of Loch Ney. And in the report that we are preparing, we make the point that Loch Ney has always had um, strategic importance because you can get to five of the six occupied counties from Loch Ney. And Mazarine Barracks is on the the banks of Loch Ney. It has a launching point. Um, So you're able to move quickly around the north if you have control of Loch Ney and you, and you have the ability to move about Loch Ney. Um, in the police, I hesitate to call it an investigation, but the review by the historical inquiries team, um, there's talk about a vehicle being burnt out nearby um, and they try to point to this vehicle as being the means of um, transport to and from the scene of the battery bar attack. But, People that we've spoken to who were either in the bar that night um, or, or would know the area fairly well say that 
yeah, they don't believe that that was the case, that the car was alike, this car was, vehicle was burnt out, that that vehicle was actually alike and being burnt out prior to the attack on the battery bar taking place. Now, Martin, I know that you've been to the battery bar, so you'll know it, you, you can step off a boat and you're more or less at the front door of the bar. It's you, you, There's a jetty right beside it. So there's a strong suspicion by the family and by people that know the area well that uh, the attackers have actually gone via patrol boat um, to the battery bar to carry out the attack. One other question. At the time, I remember Bernadette Devlin Makaliski saying at the funeral that it would be hard to convince anyone around here that it was not the, the UDR, the Ulster Defense Regiment. Did you find evidence to, to, to back up what she was saying, what local people were saying at the time in your investigation? Absolutely. She's been absolutely correct in making that statement. Um, what has transpired through the investigations that we have carried out is that on two occasions, six people were arrested um, in relation to the murders of Liam Dev or of Liam Ryan and Michael Devlin. And those six people were all members of the UDR and members of the UBF. Okay. Mary, we want to thank you very much uh, for this information uh, into the murder of an American citizen, Liam Ryan. And I, I know you were going to release the report when the delegation was there in a few weeks time. That's going to be postponed, but hopefully you can hold it back so we can have an American participation and AOH participation when you finally give this report in and give it to the ombudsman. And thank you for there being for the first time a real investigation into collusion and the murder of Liam Ryan. Okay. No, and thank you all for your continued support. We really appreciate it. Okay, next we're going to go to Belfast, back to 1973, one of those cases where an inquest has been ordered into the killing of six people, now known as the New Lodge Six, and how that would be affected. That would be cut off also by this new British proposal. And we're going to go to somebody who was not only a relative of one of those who was killed that night, but somebody who was on the ground was an eyewitness, Willie Lochran. Willie, what can you tell us about uh, the new killings of the New Lodge Six in February 1973? Thank you very much. I am Willie Lochran. My brother John was one of six men who were murdered by the British Army close on 49 years on the New Lodge Road on the 3rd and 4th of February 1973. The first two men were shot dead undercover by undercover army soldiers firing from a car and other four men were shot by soldiers then using night sights from an elevated position and nearby high raised flats. And just to add to that, the New Lodge area, uh, it's a very proud area. We're a very proud area with Republican views. So what happened was I was coming home at lunchtime, Saturday the 3rd, and I'm going up the Antrim Road at Dunkirk Gardens, and I noticed sandbags at Addingham Street and Holidays Road. So uh, I, I found that strange because Dunkirk Gardens was cut off, New Lodge, you have Tigers Bay, New Lodge, and I thought that very strange because the area is very straight, so you know, there was no mistake in what happened. So I thought that very strange. I haven't said that, but the first two men were shot by undercover British Army soldiers. There's no doubt about that. They were fired from a car and the other four men shot by soldiers then using night sights. And there were, that's the first time they were used in the North. So continue on. The fire from the car, four men were shot, soldiers in the night sights. Elevated position from high rate flats. Notwithstanding, there was a, 
an army post at the top of the New Lodge Road, Antrim Road, and that's why I'm saying they all run parallel. So it was easy. It was an easy area to seal off. So at the time the British Army Dolly Tricks went down the overdrive as they claimed there was a gun battle. This was a lie designed to cover up what happened. These shootings were totally unprovoked. And it, quite frankly, it was the mother of six civilians because of the community support. We were all were a very proud community in the New Lodge. These were political killings, in my opinion. The, in, the injustice of that night, also for almost 49 years ago, continues to this day in the denial of truth and justice by the British government to our families. So, as families, we know what happened. I know what happened on the night of the killings. But what has been denied to us, families, is our right to due, due process. With the support of Relatives for Justice, for we campaigned for a fresh inquest, which was granted by the Attorney General last February. That is why we really, really are concerned at the content of the British government's commitment paper legacy proposals, 14th of July 2021, which we potentially end the inquests, police investigations, or civil actions. If legal age for these proposals will deny us our inquest, our right to due, due process. These British proposals are about silencing families and essentially about covering up their dirty war in Ireland. I'm asking you to make your voices heard and join with us in calling on the British to withdraw these proposals, which are an insult to families of state violence. I just want to finish by thanking Martin, Donny, the AOH, and Congress, Susuja, for your support in bringing and maintaining a focus on legacy. Your interventions, interventions and support mean so much to families. It means that while British government ignore our voices and demands for truth and justice, we are being heard and that's what matters. Thank you for your time. All right, Willie, all you and what the other relatives of the New Lodge Six are asking for is simply a, an inquest, something like the Bally Murphy massacre families got, you're confident that that would show the truth that all of your relatives were innocent. Uh, they were unarmed. They were shot down by British by a British military patrol and by snipers uh, without any kind of legal justification. And this would mean if these proposals go forward, you would lose that inquest that you've been fighting for for so many years. And uh, I just also want to mention we support one of the groups that the AOH Christmas Appeals supports is the Greater New Lodge Committee. So in addition to Relatives for Justice, which has spearheaded the investigations for you and helped you get the new inquest, uh, we support the Greater New Lodge Committee, which is uh, the group that would organize a commemoration of your loved ones uh, in February on the anniversary. Okay. All right, we're next gonna go back to Tyrone. We're gonna talk about Kappa killings, uh, four people in Kappa, and we're going to go to Shauna Quinn, who's the sister of one of the victims of that incident. Shauna. Okay, so thanks, Martin. Um, as Martin said, my name is Shauna Quinn, and my brother, Dwayne O'Donnell, 
who was 17 years of age, was murdered on the 3rd of March in 1991 at Boyle's Bar in Kappa, along with John Quinn, who was 22, Malcolm Nugent, who was 20, and Thomas Armstrong, who was 52 years of age. Um, Dwayne, John and Malcolm were making their way to the local pub for a few drinks and a few games of pool on a Sunday night whilst Thomas was already in the bar at the time, along with many others. The area where we live, Galby and Kappa, it's always been regarded as a Republican stronghold in rural East Tyrone. In fact, due to the rural nature of the area, for someone unfamiliar with this area, it's very easy to get lost. And throughout the conflict, this was an area which was under heavy military presence. And local people like Dwayne and many of his friends were subjected to continuous harassment and threats by the RUC and the British Army. It was a week before the shooting that a British Army patrol entered Boyle's Bar in Kappa and took the name of those individuals who were drinking in the bar. And at the same time, they also drew a plan of the bar's layout. And as you can imagine, this was an occurrence that caused considerable unease in the area at the time. But now we know this was a common feature in this form of attack. So on the actual day of the shooting, there was a lot of British Army patrols and vehicle checkpoints during the day and into the evening. And anybody who was in the area will tell you that there was a helicopter that hovered in the sky for hours that day. However, just prior to the shooting, all military patrols and checkpoints around Galway and Kappa disappeared. And the military presence in this area made it difficult for anyone to move around without being stopped, as this area was experiencing some of the highest surveillance levels in the north of Ireland and the killer gang was able to reach and leave Kappa without even being noticed. So on the night they were murdered, Dwayne, John, Malcolm and another passenger Malachi Raverty were all together in the car and as they approached the car park in Boyle's Bar the gunmen opened fire. Malachi was the only survivor their car was riddled with bullets and then the gunmen tried to force their way into the bar. However, the occupants on hearing the initial gunfire locked the doors and um, dived for cover in the bar. Then one of the gunmen um, fired 14 times through the toilet window where Thomas had sought shelter. However, Thomas Armstrong then died as a result of a serious gunshot to his arm. We know that the RUC investigation was neither prompt, thorough or impartial. The RUC changed the forensic story. We are all now very aware of the weapons linkages as Mary and Martin have alluded to, and also their origins. But I suppose one thing that I would like to say is Although I was only 12 when Dwayne was murdered, it's something that you will never, ever forget. Um, the devastation and heartache that at 39 years of age, my mummy lost her eldest son and daddy was only 41 at the time. Um, coping with the death of a son and a brother certainly wasn't easy for my parents or for my brothers, Barry, Mark and Fergal. And in the particular year when Dwayne died in March, um, it was Mummy's 40th birthday in November that year. And I can always remember what was supposed to be a joyous occasion with Mummy turning 40 in November was completely overshadowed by Dwayne's death. And it wasn't until years after Dwayne had died that my daddy actually brought up his name in the house or was able to talk about it. And like we all do know that any death leaves an unimaginable loss for any family. But for many families, this is further compounded 
by the fact that not only were these people murdered, but they were murdered by the British state. And the past can never be the past until we are able to know the full facts of what happened to our loved ones, until we're all able to grieve and a vindication that these deaths were wrong. We deserve recognition that these horrible acts were perpetrated upon us and that it should never ever have happened. That we as families have a right to the truth and any denial of this truth is a further act of vengeance towards us. Relatives for Justice produced a comprehensive report into the campus shootings on their 25th anniversary, and it is available to download on their website for anyone wishing to do so. Um, we also engaged with the historical inquiries team for over a seven year period. However, we ended up having to take them to court to get the report published, which had been withheld from us for years. We now know the HET established involvement of the UDR in the murders, which is mainly a locally recruited unit of the British Army. The state covered it up and continue to cover it up. It is now known that our loved ones were murdered by UDR soldiers who operated by day as British soldiers who stopped, monitored and harassed local nationalists and Republican people and by night, they were involved in killing those same people. But up until now, we all know that the British government have been using the tactic of denying, delaying and withholding information in relation to inquests, in relation to inquiries. And now that many families believe that we are all getting closer to getting the truth, the British government intend introducing the statute of limitations which will close down all avenues open to families seeking answers. And I just would like to finish off by saying, on behalf of the Kappa families, we are very, very grateful to the AOH for highlighting these issues. The British government are attempting to whitewash all of this. And we are pleading with America, with Ireland, and to as many other people out there to stand with us and all the families to prevent this from happening. It is unacceptable that British state policy will continue to be covered up and it can't allow it to be happen. The British government must be held accountable and we need your help at this time. We need your intervention to ensure that we are no longer denied the justice we deserve. And just on a final note, we should all be on that same journey that does not stop until we get the truth, until we can all stand proud and say that we have been vindicated and that our families were murdered by the British state and their proxies. Shona, I, I just want to ask you a quick question. You talked yep. about the impact of your family, how terrible this was for you, your brothers, your parents. What is the impact on a new generation, children who've been born into your family since the Good Friday Agreement, and now see that in addition to having a family member killed, a brand new injustice and cover up being considered and may be enacted by the British government just to wipe out any chance that you and your family have of getting the truth about your loved ones. Okay, so uh, sorry, Martin, um, can you ask me that again? What is the impact yeah. on, on my young children? people, your yeah. children, the other nieces and nephews? Yeah, yeah, How yeah. do they? Yeah, they're not only hearing stories about a British government cover up yeah. and injustice, but now they're about to be victims of a new round of cover up and injustice firsthand, yeah. losing their right to get the truth through a civil action, through an inquest, through anything else that you would pursue. Like Martin, my. Like my children now, I have four children, there's other nieces and nephews. They have all witnessed my mother and father trying to fight for years. Like my mother and father's not getting any younger. You know, it's us now. My, our children are all watching us continuing on to, to, you know, they're asking questions all the time. You know, there's probably a negativity, neg you know, comments that's made in this house about the you know about the 
British government and all. So it's going to filter through. And the thing about it is, if we don't get any justice, we don't get any truth, it's going to filter down through generation after generation. And that's the reality of it. Okay. I want to thank you for that, Shauna. Uh, Danny, those are the three people that we've had to talk about. Um, just three examples, three separate examples out of hundreds, if not more than a thousand of what would happen if these new British laws come in, how it'd be a final cover up, a final deprivation of, ju of any path to justice. That's what's intended, even though those families are fighting the impact that it's going to have, not on those who knew these people, but the generation growing up in Ireland. Excellent, excellent words from all of our speakers today, uh, starting off with the congressman and, and just ending up here with people we've had the opportunity to meet and know over the years. We're going to move into some comments and possible questions from our panelists, going from John DC to Karen Quinn and then Sean Pender. We, at the last segment, will have some uh, friends of ours come in as guests, and they're currently in as attendees. So if you know you're coming on as a guest to ask a question or would like to ask a question, please raise your hand in the uh, so we'll be easier to find you when we go. But uh, next up, we'll hear from John DC. John. Hey, Danny, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah. OK, great. Um, yeah. Can I go back to Congressman Swosey? And um, yes, sir. I think uh, he made a couple of points that are pertinent. I think, firstly, I agree with him. I think I suspect that the congressional activity so far is having an effect. Um, and secondly, I think that that pressure needs to be kept up between now and St. Patrick's Day. He also said something quite pertinent. He said there hasn't been an official response from the administration yet. And Brendan Boyle and Congressman Swosey and Brian Fitzpatrick, they've done a lot of good work and over 20 congressmen have signed that letter and it's, it's, it's had an impact. And I also think, and I'm guessing that it hasn't gone unnoticed um, in the British government that the, the North is sliding into or drifting into a state of increased sectarianism and that this legislation, the timing of this legislation is absolutely dreadful. Now there's a delay obviously with bringing this to the house um, in London. Um, it's not clear as to why that delay um, is occurring, but some interesting things are occurring within the Conservative Party itself. Um, about a month ago, some of the more conservative members of the Conservative Party um, asked Brandon Lewis, the Secretary of State, um, to resign because he hasn't brought that legislation forward. So I'm guessing that the congressional activity is having an impact. So what needs to happen now? And my guess is we need to start joining up the dots. And the most uh, practical and uh, relevant issue that comes to mind is the Irish government needs to bring this up with Joe Biden in the White House in March. And it needs to make it clear and verbalize that it will be bringing up this issue in the Oval Office. And I don't mean mentioning it in, in a press statement beforehand, but giving the commitment that it will bring this up in the Oval Office. And that in turn will make the administration uh, make an official position or its official position be known. Um, you know, I think the pressure is on in the Oireachtas. It's clear that uh, from the debates that have occurred in the Senate and the Dáil, that people are, are on this issue as well. Um, this week, we've had the Archbishop, uh, Eamon Martin, uh, issuing a pretty strong statement. So all that helps, but I do believe the Irish government needs to weigh in here officially and make it clear to the president that this is a priority. I, I think you're absolutely right, and I appreciate your direction and help on this. And for those of you that don't know, John is working directly with the uh, Ancient Order Hibernians in America as a liaison to both the Irish government, um, the government in the North Ireland and the United States uh, government. We've learned a lot and we appreciate your help. Um, and we really appreciate you uh, being involved hands on. Uh, one of the things I could tell you about John is when we got involved, we were talking about a very limited issue and uh, John jumped in with both feet and have been involved with every issue 
the ancient or Hibernian and Irish American has. And that's greatly appreciated, John. Um, Thanks, next up is our guest from uh, uh, Sinn Féin. Uh, I got to uh, spend a little bit of time with him a couple months ago and uh, really enjoyed his company. But more importantly, his insight and his knowledge. And, and I learned a little bit about your background for the first time, uh, yeah, Karen. And, and I, I'm going to maybe speaking out of school, but he has served as chief of staff for uh, Martin McGinnis, great friend of the AOH, Jerry Adams, great friend of the AOH, and Mary Lou McDonald, a great friend of the AOH. But most importantly, Rito O'Hara tells us he's a heck of a guy and uh, he's really uh, brings a wealth of knowledge. And Karen, the floor is yours. Anybody who knows Rita, that's the highest praise you can ever get. You're called competent alone by Rita O'Hara. It's actually apart from the rule. Thanks, <laughs> thanks, thanks for the opportunity uh, to come back on the panels and for the invites, the ongoing invites. And I mean, I can't articulate any better the, the, the the depth of heart uh, that has been articulated by Shauna, Willie, and Mary. And I think it's before you even looking at the legacy issue, you have to remember this. It was British government policy to intimidate nationalist and Republican communities, whether it's in the New Lodge, Bar, Murphy, or elsewhere. It was British government policy to target Republicans, whether it was Liam Rand, or whether it was in Cabot, or whether it was Sinn Fein members. And it's British government policy since those attacks to cover up for them. So that's that's where this this didn't end as a one-off instance or two-off instance, a couple of instances in the 70s, 80s, or even out through the 90s. The cover-up has continued. So to, and I just want to take a step back, Martin, just talk about how we got to where we are today. Um, it, the Strong Towns Agreement was signed in 2014. It was agreed by all the parties in the two governments as being the way forward. It had the support of victims groups to move ahead. Two years ago, uh, in January 2020, the British government, with the parties, agreed the new decade, new deal, or new approach agreement. And that made the, the onus was on the British government, among a number of things, to legislate for Stormont House within, 10 day, within 100 days. And they signed up that, Boris Johnson signed up that. Within 90 days in March, they had abandoned that position. There was nothing new in Stormont House. They knew exactly what they were signing up for. It had been in, it had been in discussion since 2014. It had been de developed and implemented in the legislation over six years. So you have to come to the position that the British government had no intention of honouring that agreement. And that's, for that in mind, that's the type of British government you're dealing with. So then, whenever they didn't put any more detail, they just said they weren't about by Stormont House and they needed a fundamental review after six years. In June the 24th, the Irish and British government, International uh, Intergovernmental Conference, agreed that there would be a consultation process. And what they said was that the, they would really look at the legacy issue and it had to comply fully with international human rights obligations and respond to the needs of victims and survivors and society as a whole. And that was, I was brought back to Stormont House again. So the Irish and British government decided to have a further consultation process and agreed to that this had to reflect on the international human rights uh, approaches and agreements. Within four weeks, the British government produced their command paper. And as Willie laid out, that command paper uh, advocated that there be an end to all judicial investigations, inquiries, even civil actions and sought, which is no one else has asked for, an unconditional amnesty. So I think that that's the key bit to bring us right up to date. That consultation process rolled on and it had no effect. And it was, it was actually became a, a point of contention. There, no records were even kept of meetings. And what we have finalized and where this has landed was Brandon Lewis met with the parties in December. And he basically says, don't call us, we will call you, and we will call you whenever the draft legislation is being tabled at Westminster. I, I have a slightly different take in terms of time scaleness from John. This will not wait until March. Every indication is that the British government are going to table this, I would say, within the next coming weeks in terms of the draft legislation to push that ahead. They have showed no 
inclination to pull back from the proposals. What we haven't seen is we have not even seen how they're going to implement it, how these are going to be consistent with the Good Friday Agreement, Strong Towers Agreement, or any international human rights uh, standards. So I'm of the opinion that they will, put, they will push ahead with this, which brings us on to them, well, what, what do we do about it? Mary Lou MacDonald and myself and uh, Don Doyle, her chief of staff, met in Washington with the administration. We briefed them fully on them. We continue to brief them through their embassy and through the consulate. We met with the congressional leaders on the Hill, with Chuck Schumer, with Senator Bob Menendez, with Senator Chris Murphy, and with the Friends of Ireland and Richie Nee, and they're all briefed. And the key piece is this, is, this, is the Congress is solid on the issue of legacy. It's a bipartisan approach. The administration have yet to say anything publicly on it, but they're well aware of what the issues are around it. And their position has to be consistent with their position on Brexit. President Biden, when he talked about Brexit, says that they had to protect the Good Friday Agreement, that there can be no unilateral actions from either the governments or the EU, and a resolution had to be found within the agreements. If that's the position on Brexit, that should also be the position in regard to legacy. The British government cannot act unilaterally in this, and they are on their own. There's no other body advocating their position by their military. They should be, the agreements can be found, the agreement is already there in terms of Islamic House needs to be returned to. And lastly, the, the, uh, the Good Friday Agreement must be protected. And this runs a coach and horses through it. So I, I think that there, there's an onus on ourselves and everybody who the friends of Ireland to, we need to look to see when this legislation is going to be produced in a draft form. It will take a series of months to go through Westminster and that will be the pinch points for this. So as soon as that legislation's unveiled, I would love to see Irish America, I'd love to see Congress, I would like to see the president say something about the intent of the British government and for us to shape that process before it becomes a law in Westminster and before families are forced back into courts to dispute British legislation. And all of this, as I say, all of this, we have been through this for so many years. The British government know exactly what needs to be done. They know exactly what they signed up to in Stormont House. They need to come back to that agreement. And that is the foundation principle of any political process. It's a foundation principle of how we get our lives. And that is you reach an agreement and you honor it. You do the right thing by people. You give people closure. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So I think there's a piece of work ahead of us, Danny. I think it'll be on a shorter time scale. I mean, I would be I would be surprised if the Irish government aren't really talking to the administration. The administration are fully aware of what is being proposed. We haven't seen the detail of it. And then it'll become a very, very live issue as soon as this draft legislation is tabled. Thank you uh, very much for your insight. Uh, John, Karen, uh, great, great words all the way around. Uh, we're going to move to our National Vice President, Sean Pender, followed by LAOH National Vice President, Marilyn Madigan. And then we're going to go back to Martin and our three speakers for closing comments. I want to thank everybody for being on today's call. We had over 150 people on and some in and out, so I'm sure the numbers were higher. And traditionally, we get a lot of, uh, a lot of response from our YouTube video. Uh, Chris Cook, our, our uh, coordinator of digital services, is uh, put on the chat, the website for Relatives for Justice, so you could access that report that was uh, brought up earlier. And we are going to move to Brother Pender. Morning. Can you hear me okay, Dan? Yes, sir. All right. Um, Willie and Sean, thank you very much for, for telling your story uh, today. Uh, it was great to see Congressman Swazi uh, here as an example of the uh, bipartisan support we have on this issue. And uh, Mary, thank you um, and RFJ for all the great work you've done. It was great uh, uh, joining you in Belfast in the past and also um, in DC when you testified before the uh, Mantos uh, Commission. So continued great, uh, great job on, on your part. But what's interesting today when we heard this story is like, when, when have we heard this before, huh? When we heard how the Brits are able to get in and get out, uh, in the case of Pat Panukin, there was always a, a very strong presence. Uh, and all of a sudden, the night Pat was murdered, it was gone. Sean Graham, before the attack at, at the bookies, there was police and, uh, and armed forces there, and then they left. 
the same story in Lachlan Island and, and, and Kappa, a very, very difficult area to get in and get out of. And how did they get in and get out of? Because they were led in there. And the same story seems like happened in our book. But as Shawna said, were there investigations that were prompt and proper? No, there was just simply cover up. Despite ballistics and forensic evidence, it was just covered up and they denied and delayed. And now the British government would like to tell you that they're trying to draw a line in the sand so they can move, move forward. But this amnesty is nothing more than an official cover up as that they see. And the reason they're doing this because they see the truth is coming out slowly. But in cases like um, Bloody Sunday, Ballin Murphy, and just recently the Miami show band, the Brits will do everything in their power to attempt to cover up and not agree to previous uh, agreements that are signed by the British government, the U.S. government and the Irish government. And we must continue to do events like this to support the people in the north and the victims who, who have lost uh, loved ones. We have to advocate for them. We have to continue our work in the House, in the Senate with people like Congressman Swazi, and we will continue our work with uh, John Deasy, who's become a very important friend to the AOH uh, and our outreach to the U.S. and Irish uh, government. Uh, but we have to continue to support this. This is not over. Uh, and Britain must understand without justice, there will be no trade. We will do everything in our power to, to hold their feet to the fire to make sure that they simply tell the truth because the truth costs nothing. Thank you all for this great uh, presentation and Martin, especially for your efforts in putting it together. Thank you, Sean. And, and I just want to take a minute to uh, thank Sean for the work he's done uh, beyond his duties as vice president. Sean has uh, historically been organizing Freedom for Ireland trips. Uh, a lot of work went into a trip that we had to push and uh, Sean wasn't going to cancel. He said, we'll push it and we'll adjust and we'll overcome. But Sean also, uh, uh, served as Freedom for Ireland chairs for many years. And in addition to Sean and Martin, we have on uh, as attendees today, Brendan Moore, uh, longtime Freedom for Ireland chair, and really set the modern day foundation for our Freedom for Ireland Christmas appeal. I mean, it started, uh, our support started before Brendan, but Fr Brendan really set the framework that we use today. And Paul Gowdy from Michigan is also on. And Combined with uh, working with so many people, um, these folks have led uh, the donation in the last 20 years of $1.25 or $1.26 million to the various groups that we work with in the North Ireland. And this year, uh, Martin and Dolores uh, Dash are on track to set another record uh, uh, Christmas appeal collection. So I really want to uh, congratulate you for that work and and roll right into welcoming our uh, vice president of the ladies ancient order hibernians uh, marilyn madigan thank you danny and thank you for this webinar it was very informative and educational for everyone i want to let everybody know that the ladies ancient order of hibernians is very committed to the protection of the good friday agreement if we listen to our pope paul the sixth he said if we want peace we need to work for justice we deserve justice. These people deserve justice. We are against amnesty. We need to have the truth. The truth will help everyone have justice for their families, for their loved ones, and for any future generations. And I wanna say on behalf of our president, Karen Keene, under her leadership and the leadership of Dolores Desch and our Freedom for All Ireland Committee, the women are very committed to do whatever we need to do to help the families. I was able to be at the site of Liam Ryan's death and I know how remote of an area was. So there had to be help for him to be murdered. We need the truth to come out and the British government cannot make rules to give these men or women whoever perpetrated these atrocities be let go. So I want to assure you that the ladies, ancient earth librarians will do whatever we need to do to help the truth and the justice come forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there's Martin correcting me. Uh, 
uh, muting. I don't know how many times I've done this. Uh, well, that's the first time this year. So, uh, Martin, I would turn it over to you and our, our guest speakers and, and our panelists. I want to thank you all so much as uh, we're going to go on to Martin and uh, hear the last words and then move to closing. And thank you to all of our guests. Without you, we could not do the work we do uh, with our friends in Ireland. Martin? Just very quickly, first of all, I know Marilyn and Dolores have a webinar scheduled for next week on January 15th, I believe, on Bloody Sunday, and people should look out for links to that. We're looking forward to that very much. Um, I also want to thank Mark Thompson and Relatives for Justice. Um, as I said, Liam Ryan was a very close friend of mine that was a clear example of what happened and never thought that he had any chance to get justice, to get truth. I mean, the British killed him, they were celebrating and they were very pleased with what had happened. It was just a whitewash. But thanks to Relative for Justice, people like Mary McCallan and others. Now, these families, all the families that you heard from have a chance to get justice uh, through different ways, whether it's an inquest, whether it's a civil action, whether it's an ombudsman report, but there's a coordination. Families have come together. They have a chance to fight for truth and thanks to the AOH and other groups in Irish America who are participating in this webinar today, the Brehens, the IAUC, Irish Northern Aid and the others. We have a combined approach that we can go to people like Congressman Swazi, like the Friends of Ireland and others, and make sure that those concerns, that fight for justice goes right to Congress, goes right through Congress to the administration. But the most important thing is the people who came on today. I mean, the sad thing is, Relative to Justice could have got any number of groups, examples, people like this who would have been able to tell similar stories about different events, different murders, different killings across the north of Ireland. But I have always found, and you hear it again today and it proved it again today, that there is nothing like hearing the voices of people who were relatives, who were victims, who were survivors in the north of Ireland, just simply give the truth to an American audience. And you heard it today from Mary, from Shauna, and from Willie. And that, I know, will have an impact with everyone here. And it shows you why we support groups like Relatives for Justice. Thank you, Danny, for putting this on. Thank you. And then we'll just go right around the horn there. Mary? Yes, uh, just thank you. And to pick up on a few comments that were made, uh, Sean Pender mentioned Pafanukin. And it's just to say that, you know, the De Silva review into the murder of um, Pafanukin covers the exact same time frame when Liam Ram was murdered up until 1989 and the provision of intelligence information, um, both the UDA and UVF. So, so we do, you know, there's information and evidence there that supports what we're putting forward in relation to this. I think you're absolutely right that the only way that we prevent the British from seeking this amnesty is through international pressure and international solidarity um, and your continued interest in what is happening here. Um, but I also agree with Kieran that I don't think this is something that can wait until March. This legislation has been muted for quite a while. It was spoken about that it could have been introduced before Christmas in November and December. Um, I think that it hasn't been introduced for a number of reasons, but one of which is because one of the families from the New Lodge 6 um, part of Willie's group had actually taken a court case, asking the court to give a provisory judgment against it. Um, but the court had said that it's too soon and they won't be able to look at it until it's actually released. So Kieran's very accurate whenever he's saying that once this, entry, once this legislation is released, families will need to move very quickly to try and block it. And we will only be able to do that if we have um, international pressure coming from yourselves because, you know, whatever a court in Belfast decides is one thing, um, the British government will only be swayed by international colleagues um, and international pressure from other people and other governments. Um, and, and we rely on you for that. So, so thank you for this. Uh, thank you. Uh, that was great words, great talk. And remember everyone, the link to the website that Mary mentioned earlier is in the uh, comments. Uh, so please uh, check that out or simply look it up. There's a lot of great work and we're going to move to Willie and Willie and I got together and I wore my Christmas tie and my green and he put up his Christmas tree. And so Willie, your closing comments. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Tell me. 
Uh, closing comments are simple. The British Army, before the death of the six men on the New Lord's Road, were, were not to be seen in the area. It was so quiet and calm. It was unbelievable. It was actually eerie that the gunfire started. And I must say, it was public execution of six colleagues of mine, friends. And I don't know if I've emphasized that point enough. But the area was cleared, no question about it. The deed was done. And then it was, they were all gunmen. There was no gunmen. There was no trace of anything been armed. The autopsy showed that. So thank you for giving me that time. Uh, it was really a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Willie. Uh, God bless you. We appreciate your work. And we're going to move for our final closing comments to Sheena. Okay. So just um, for those listening, I'm sure you can all hear the similarities between the three cases. Um, I know on behalf of the Kappa families that it's extremely encouraging and heartwarming to know that you are so far away, but you care about our family members who were murdered by the British state. And, you know, we, we want to thank you for so much for your continued support and also RFJ's continued support because I don't know what we would have done without them. And um, over the years, like it's 31 years now, um, on the 3rd of March this year that the boys were have been murdered and we have just lodged the papers or Phoenix Law have just lodged the papers for a civil case and they're actually preparing the papers for a fresh inquest and we want this we've waited long enough so i can't ask for please please to support and help the families and thank you thank you very much and really since before the founding of the united states of america we have been dealing with broken british promises and i think that's kind of what was said right there and i remind everybody as we sit here in our homes and and we're talking about murder. And we're talking about 34 years ago. And we're talking about 49 years ago. And, and soon we're going to be talking about Bloody Sunday 50 years ago. 50 years. It's ridiculous that we still have to have these conversations. But with that, we're going to move to 2016. In a way, I've enjoyed closing many of our webinars in Pearl River, one of our great uh, homes of uh, Hibernians uh, had one of the best 1916 commemorations I've ever seen. And we'll close with a uh, song and thank you all. And we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar.
light lying shining through the foggy Thank you. 